the mic over there. I want to thank you for being brave and courageous and going to Japan in the face of such horror and doing this film. It's really a wonderful film. Thank you. Oh, that's my favorite kind of question. <laughs> Is that a question? Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I think the thing that was afraid, I was afraid of earthquakes before and there were so, so many aftershocks. That was the thing that I found very scary. And um, uh, But the Japanese people we spoke to made us feel so um, welcome. And I felt happy to be there because it felt like I didn't want to be intrusive and I was very sensitive to that but I felt like so many people around the world like I'm sure you all here were caring so deeply about people there and as the ambassador said so wonderfully you know I think the people there didn't realize the message was not getting through to them that the rest of the world was caring so much about them and when we actually showed up and and asked people how they were and what they needed and and said how you know front pages of newspapers and for example in England and the whole front page was saying come on Japan and you know everybody around the world was just thinking non-stop uh, and wishing well everybody in that region and they didn't know so it was really and it, it felt um, uh, like a really good thing to do to actually be able to take that message to those people over there Lucy thank you for making this film and for showing the courage, like you said, to go there at a time and when fear was rampant. I wanted to ask you, one of the quotes that I liked most in the movie was when the Japanese girl was talking about the cherry blossom and how she wanted to film the rebuilding or she wanted to take pictures of the rebuilding. Will there be more films about cherry blossoms after the tsunami to do follow-ups to see how Japan transforms? Because Japan will come back. Thank you, I totally agree. And um, there are some wonderful projects. Uh, there are lots of wonderful film projects. I actually feel a little bit worried now that lots of people will show up with video cameras and really bother these people. And uh, not not these people in the film, but people in the whole region. And I, I hope that, um, you know, that people aren't gonna be bothered by too many uh, uh, p people. Um, but, uh, uh, but there are so many fantastic projects and I'm sure they're gonna be fantastic film projects. In fact, I know of a couple. And there's also wonderful projects. There's a wonderful project that I like called Sakura Front. Sakura means cherry blossom. You probably heard it. And um, they are planting cherry blossom along the line that the tsunami uh, hit around that um, edge and with an idea of both com commemorating and also um, sort of providing a, a sort of a guide for people in the future generations where there ever to be a tsunami, where is the high ground, and also just a very beautiful, um, uh, you know, for all the reasons that we love cherry blossom. And I think that's one lovely cherry blossom related project, but there are many actually, and, um, and our website has uh, suggestions of how to help and and um, I think this is going to be fantastic rebuilding. I like the young uh, volunteer as well who says we can build you know uh, in the future great eco towns and this kind of young energy. For me uh, the film is um, uh, about this journey that human beings can go on from tragedy to finding the courage and the grace and the wisdom to move forward. And how do you carry on? How do you rebuild? And these people for me were so inspiring, so impressive in their attitudes to that rebuilding. And I was so struck by that throughout Japan, that the courage uh, of the people and the community spirit and for example the manager of the refugee center who had to step up despite the terrible pain and grief that he was feeling to manage this gigantic sudden refugee center that he seemed to be in charge of and all those people with so many needs and everywhere I went I was so impressed with the way that people had risen to this challenge and you always ask yourself oh my goodness would I find that in myself if I I was confronted with such such a challenge, and uh, and so I think there's going to be so many stories moving forward in the future of incredible uh, 
beautiful new projects and buildings and towns and innovations uh, that are going to come from that region. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a question? Sort of. Uh, so you have a favorite kind of question too. Um, my name is Delphine Kaoru Tsen, so I'm half Taiwanese, half Japanese. Um, ten years ago, I lost my home, my grandparents, in the earthquake. I went back there to find every house, um, and every house has a funeral in it. And with that, I lost my culture, my language, and my grandfather, who I love the most in the world. And then 10 years later, I'm studying at RPI in New York. And 10 years later, I got an email in March and saying there's a tsunami warning to Taiwan, and I hope I'll get to talk to you again. And that's the end of email. Who writes to their daughter like that? <laughs> and, and I turned on the TV, and that's what I saw. And, and I just want you to know, you, you, you have, I, I really hope you have an idea how much we appreciate it, how much it means to us, and how important it is to all of us, not just Japanese people, not just Taiwanese people, but to everyone to know that, yes, we can survive. We will overcome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't know how to follow that, but just to thank you so much and to say how sorry I am for what you've been through. And so if the film does nothing else, then, uh, then you've gotten to see it. That makes it all worthwhile. Is there another question over there? When you dig down into the sediments in these areas, you find that this has happened four or five times in historical times. And as such, there is nothing stupider than rebuilding. These areas should be declared as national parks, agricultural land, anything but. Did you bump into anybody with the wisdom to not rebuild? I don't think people mean necessarily rebuild just there, and I think that is a good point. Uh, I know that some people there definitely mentioned that previous generations have been wise enough not to build here, and they had felt um, that it had been their mistake to ignore that wisdom of previous generation and build on land that um, previous generations may have considered too risky for tsunamis. So I'm not sure where people are going to build exactly, um, but a lot of people are displaced placed and need homes, and so somebody's going to be rebuilding something somewhere, and. Um, and I hope that there's some great thinking that goes into that. I'm sure there will be, because I know there's a, I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but is it, oh, I think it's something absolutely, the ambassador will know over 100,000 people displaced or something. I forget the exact number now. It's a lot of people. Did you have a particular approach that helped them to be comfortable talking to you? It's a good question. No, I did not. I wish I spoke Japanese. Sadly, I do not. I speak very few words. Um, but I, we had a third team member who was very critical. So it was myself, our incredible director of photography, Aaron Phillips, and another guy called James McWhite, who is uh, from Seattle originally, but moved to Japan aged 18 and is now about 25. So he, he's been there seven years and speaks Japanese fluently and is a very charming young guy. And it was the three of us only uh, in a little car and um, with our equipment on our backs uh, doing everything. And James did uh, all the translating and did, I think, a wonderful job. And as the ambassador no noted, I think that perhaps because we were three sort of uh, Westerners, uh, we perhaps um, were a bit of a curiosity. And so that when we were in that landscape, people would actually come up to us and say, um, what are you doing here? Are you OK? And um, uh, we're very uh, Happy, to, happy that we were there, it seemed. I was very grateful because I would, as I've been very sensitive about intruding. And, um, and I'm, I think that the, I always think with documentaries, there's, a, there's simple things about, I think that the smallness of our team helped a lot. 
I think because we were very, it was very human to human. We were very small, very low key, very direct. And um, there wasn't like a big crew of people texting or looking bored or, you know, it wasn't a professional kind of thing. And I really enjoy that small footprint for every reason, including, um, you know, keeping a light environmental uh, um, footprint as you travel. Um, but I credit James' this wonderful translation and charm a lot. And, um, and I also think that people instinctively, when are, they're asked respectful questions, they often want to share the truth. And if it is that direct environment where people are obviously just very um, keen to hear your true story and asking you real questions, uh, hopefully you're sometimes giving people an opportunity to reflect that they don't even have. I think sometimes documentary filmmakers have a reputation for um, barging into a scene that they don't even take the trouble to understand and exploiting some people and um, making them twist their words and, 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 and make things to say, them, say that they don't even want to say and then we go off and manipulate lies in the editing room and make loads of money and ruin lives without thinking of them again. And I think that the reverse can be true, I think. This was a slightly specific example, but I think sometimes when you as a documentary filmmaker, um, genuinely want to share people's stories and genu genuinely want to understand what it's like from somebody else's point of view. And you genuinely want the audience to have an opportunity to walk in the shoes of people that they're never going to get an opportunity to meet unless they see the film. That this can be, you know, you, you don't have to be that good at asking questions. There are some, there are some skills in that, but mostly I think you're so aligned with this, you know, people People actually want to, at that point, um, be have their you know say, be understood and 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 and. Um, but I was very uh, struck by how incredibly open and courageous people were in sharing their stories. And as you've experienced, I think that's what the strength of the film is: their honesty and um, courage is what allows us to really feel like we can understand what they're going through and I think that's what the power of the film is. So I was very, very grateful to them. Yes. Yes. First of all, I would like to disagree with the idea of not sweet building. I think in some degree it will be an insult to those, not just in Japan, not just in Europe, or in America to personally survive disasters of various types, earthquakes, tornadoes, whatever. But also the memory of those who want to continue on. Anyways, my question is, is what was it like to just travel to Japan in the midst of a crisis? And will, be, will there be any chance that in the future we'll see the end results of the rebuilding efforts? Um, it was uh, it was a very intense experience to travel to Japan at that time, and uh, it, it was nerve-wracking. There were lots of, you know, for example, lots of aftershocks, and I am a real wimp when it comes to earthquakes. And some of the earth aftershocks were very big, like magnitude six or seven. And um, and at the beginning, I felt like the girl in an Indiana Jones movie. I was just scre screaming and screeching. I dropped a camera and smashed it at one point because it was an earthquake. And I felt really very afraid. By the end, you know, we were staying in this um, beautiful but very rustic, very simple, and not very earthquake-proofed uh, Ryoken, this sort of very rustic in, in the mountains. And you'd be woken up by this giant aftershock and I just roll over and go back to sleep. So by the end I was used to it, but it was a very um, intense experience and for example when we were staying, we were staying in this Ryoken which was um, full of rescue workers and everyone was male, it was quite a big place, maybe 200 people or more. 
uh, 400 people, and I was the only woman in the whole place. So they had the female side of the baths, or communal baths, and male side of the baths. And uh, but I was the only woman, so the men were all using the female side of the baths as well, of course. So if I wanted a bath, I had, which I really did, because we were working in those landscapes and it was very important to wash. So I had to wait for the rescue workers. To, so it was this very particular experience uh, on a just very practical level. Um, I've never been in a disaster zone before, um, but uh, this disaster zone, as the ambassador mentioned, was so, um, such a complicated and difficult disaster. I was expecting the disaster zone would be a small area with a lot of rescue workers in it, a lot of journalists. Instead, it's a huge area that was devastated by the tsunami. You know, a couple of miles in land, 100 miles down, and uh, everywhere you looked in every dimension was um, completely uh, smashed to bits. And very few people in the landscape, as you see in the film, no other journalists, no other film crews, and uh, very few people of the people that we met, you know, that were picking through, looking for their house, because they couldn't even find where the tsunami had put their house, or looking for their possessions, or, you know, doing the cleanup work, and uh, very intense being in that environment. Um, you expect that the pictures are going to be, you know, if one took the worst pictures, and you're going to get there and sort of, uh, you know, be be sort of underwhelmed by the reality, but on the contrary, going there, nothing had prepared me for the reality of going there, so it was incredibly intense, and just processing all this um, uh, work and constantly questioning what we're doing there, how we should be doing it, what was the best thing for the film, what was the best thing for the people there. It was very, um, uh, it was very intense time, so. Um, I'm, I'm afraid we've run out of time for, for more questions, but uh, I thought you might want to uh, uh, briefly uh, say um, what the reception to this film has been in Japan since it's uh, been finished, and I, I imagine it's been shown there quite a bit. We're sort of only just getting the film out there, really, so you're actually very early among the people to see it. We've just had our first screening in Japan, and we've been sharing it with individuals in Japan and trying to figure out how to, what's the most appropriate way. Um, in the US, it's going to be on HBO and also at lots of special event screenings, so uh, do look out for it and uh, share that. And our website also has information about how to help and be involved. Um, and uh, in Japan, I have been, I wasn't sure, I'm a Westerner, I'm from England and live here in the US, and I wasn't sure what on earth Japanese people would think of the film. We had a fantastic Japanese editor and um, who con contributed enormously to the film, including finding the opening shot. Um, but still, there was so much of me and I'm not Japanese, uh, so I wasn't sure. I thought maybe the film is about Japan and our love of Japan, but for non-Japanese people. So I have been so um, happy, though, that uh, when some Japanese people have seen it, that their response has been very uh, wonderful and very gratifying, and everyone on the team is so happy that uh, Japanese people also have been responding. I was, I was thinking, well, maybe they knew everything about cherry blossoms already, this is not news, but really, we've been getting wonderful um, comments. I, I even got one amazing email, somebody that was a survivor that said that they had been feeling so bad and suffering so much that they didn't even want to live anymore, and somehow seeing the film had reminded them uh, that they could revive, and uh, as these beautiful comments of uh, half Taiwanese, half Japanese friend whose name I've forgotten that just spoke, you know, that for me makes everything so worthwhile, you know, nothing as a filmmaker I think could mean more than uh, that kind of reaction. Thank you very much, Mr. Walker.